acronyms, abbreviations formed by letters or initials to stand for important groups and periods. For the Civil Rights Movement, I give it the acronym PSU. Perseverance, Strength, Unity. Like clockwork, individuals from all walks of life became resilient leaders in the movement. Perseverance, which ran through the veins of people who decided to never give into the restraints of fear. Strength was always carried within the numbers of people who put their bodies on the lines for rights. Unity is the gift of the civil rights movement that mended the 400 year torn black and white tapestry in the land of the free and brave. I want to share with you all a jewel, a jewel that has been hidden within the shadows of the Mississippi Delta. Sharing equals freedom. Freedom to break the woven discrimination and racism chains. Freedom to shatter the silence. history textbook, uh, you won't find it uh, uh, pretty much in any uh, document that talks about uh, the history of our state. And so I thought it was fitting and proper uh, uh, to put the Hawkins legacy in the congressional record. So when we would uh, be researching going forward, uh, anything that might have contributed uh, to the betterment of Mississippi's history, you could come upon uh, uh, the Hawkins family. And so part of what I've tried to historically do is to include many people who have made history in this state, but however would be somehow omitted. Mississippi Textbook Commission that approves textbooks to be taught uh, uh, in, in Mississippi schools. For the most part, there's no civil rights uh, part in those books. So unless uh, people make an extra effort to include the Hawkins family in the educational and civil rights history of Mississippi, you'd never find it. Association, they funded a three-day training where they came in and they provided book bags to us. And these book bags were full with all of the tools necessary 
to train people in Shaw to become archivists, recording their stories, preserving those stories, how to upload those stories, how to interpret artifacts, how to tell if this is an old picture versus one that's been doctored up through digital imaging or whatever the case may be. I'm Linda Welch, the Artistic Director for StoryWorks, and this is our StoryWorks team, which I'll introduce you to in a second. StoryWorks is a documentary theater project that transforms investigative reporting into theater around the country. And as I look at your family, Lord and Mary Sue and Nola Bay, who's not with us right now, um, I, we are so proud and so honored to be here to tell your story and so grateful to you um, to be so brave. Um, this is deep, fact-based storytelling that gets to the red-hot core of huge issues in communities such as Shaw, and um, it takes an entire community to be willing to, to go there to tell these stories and um, work together to do so. Andrew Hawkins Sr., May 16, 1918 through April 17, 2000, was a civil rights activist who dedicated his life to improving the town of Shaw, Mississippi. He was a Freemason and U.S. Army veteran. As a member of the NAACP and a strong supporter of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Council of Federated Organizations, Mr. Hawkins was a galvanizing force in the Shaw Civil Rights Movement. He was also a founder of the Mississippi Freedom Labor Union alongside other citizens of Shaw and SNCC volunteers. In 1965, he ran for mayor of Shaw as a representative of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Two years later, he became the named plaintiff in a class action civil rights lawsuit, Hawkins versus Town of Shaw alongside several others, including his wife, Mary Lou Hawkins. Well, it was, it was a trial before Judge Caney in Greenville. Uh, Jonathan Shapiro and I tried it. Jonathan was the lead attorney in the trial. And I was second chairing the case with him. Uh, we put the facts together, together, ultimately write the briefs together. Uh, the trial itself, Jonathan was the lead counsel. Uh, one of the highlights, Yale Raven was sitting on a platter, took a prominent role in establishing the disparities based upon race throughout the I can say that, you know, you have to believe that all African Americans in the town of Shaw and the Mississippi Delta, throughout Mississippi and the South, and elsewhere in this country, were all subjected at that time and still are to, uh, to discriminatory treatment. So if that is not unusual. You know, what's going on in this country right now has been going on. Uh, it is not. It's not acceptable when we first arrived here, and it's not acceptable now. Mr. Hawkins testified about his experiences, his day-to-day -day life in Shaw, dealing with the disparities. Uh, and uh, we had experts, other experts, who testified on, on, on various things. The city's case was defended uh, by arguing that it really wasn't racial discrimination, it was discrimination based upon a variety of factors other than race. 
but the courts ultimately recognized what we thought was, was obvious that you can't uh, put, for example, like high intensity street lights. Every one of them is in the white community. And all of the bare bulb fixtures, if there were any, were in the black community. And saying it had nothing to do with race. Uh, it's hard to argue against these statistics, which are compelling, but in most cases were overwhelming. On January 23rd, 1971, the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit reversed Judge Katie's decision to dismiss the lawsuit. In finding that African American residents were not being afforded equal protection under the law, the Fifth Circuit pointed to the disparities in paved streets and installed lights, sanitary sewers, water mains, fire hydrants, and surface water draining. As the court concluded, we are dealing with some of the most basic amenities of urban life and the disparities are by no means slight. The town's policies have created a situation in which the black portion of town is severely disadvantaged. To remedy the infringed rights of its African-American residents, the town of Shaw was ordered to submit a plan for the court's approval detailing how it proposes to cure the results of the long history of discrimination which the record reveals. The town appealed the decision. And the roads, we didn't have any uh, black cop roads uh, in the storm. Back then, we had a dirt road. Just a plain dirt road. And then, later on in, in uh, 69, I think it was, there was a few rock roads. And uh, the white neighborhood had paved streets, plenty of light. They had water, fire hydrants. The black fisher had two fire hydrants. One up there by the church. And one up there a little past uh, the bridge. But we didn't have them. We had to go, I don't know how far if the house kind of tight run out because we didn't have water hydrants. We hear about. We didn't, at first, we didn't have no lights over here. And I think in the 60s, they put us, what? We got four or five lights in the building. And then they didn't want the folks to have sewage, uh, you know, the running sewage. They had, it was a ditch, the stuff kids used to run in. Because the white part of town all had their sidewalks and street lights and, and uh, gutters and sewers and all of that. And as soon as you get in the black areas, there was something none of that. And um, I mean, it was just starkly obvious. And the quality of the houses was totally different uh, because of the disparity of income. And as long as the white plantation owners were in control, and they were in control, uh, they, you know, they dictated how much people got paid and therefore kept everybody in severe poverty. So it didn't matter how hard you worked, you still were not going to have enough um, for basic necessities. have demonstrated a lack of willingness to support any civil rights uh, legislation or any 
principles of equity uh, in this state. Uh, the only real remedy for what we have accomplished in this state, we've had to go to court. Uh, we had to go to court to integrate the schools. Uh, we had to go to court to get the right to vote. Uh, we had to go to the court to get the right to run for office. So if, if, if for no other reason, uh, the, the, the legacy of civil rights in this state was basically the federal courts. And so in order for us to get this story out, again, uh, we're gonna have to devise uh, innovative methods of, of putting it out, otherwise it won't happen. So um, uh, I'm convinced that historians, in researching uh, educational equity, municipal equity, uh, in terms of services and other things, will now uh, come up on the Hawkins story uh, because people have now started pushing it out. Town indoor plumbing facilities uh, could be hooked up to the system, but that's circular reasoning. If there's a sanitary sewer system in your neighborhood, you can hook up your bathroom. Not the other way around. Uh, so those kinds of defenses were raised. What they'd say as well, there's nothing in the city code that requires you to have in your plumbing. Uh, but had you run the sewer system in the black community, there would have been indirect plumbing. Uh, so we established this, these disparities, we established this discrimination. And uh, Judge Cavan moved against us. We begin with a familiar rule that the exercise of the powers of the municipality with respect to making of public improvements, the establishments, utilities, and the furnishing of public services rests in the discretion of the governing municipal authorities insofar as the matter is not controlled by positive law and the courts will not undertake to control or interfere with the exercise of such discretion in the absence of bad faith or abuse. Thus, it would seem that determination of the necessity and character of public improvements, the matter of their construction and the priority of accomplishment, ordinarily are questions to be resolved by officials, usually elected who constitute the governing authority of the municipal team. An order dismissing the complaint will be uh, Shaw was no different than a whole bunch of communities. Uh, uh, now, for my part, uh, uh, I was a student at Tougaloo College, uh, involved in voter registration and a lot of things. And, uh, first campaign I worked in was Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer's campaign uh, for the office I now hold uh, in the United States House of Representatives. And I remember coming home talking to my mother about um, what was going on and how uh, I was really um, concerned about the people in the Delta and them not being able to to really vote without fear of intimidation. And, you know, my mama said, you know, people don't vote here. And so it was a shock to me that, that I'm going, you know, 150 miles from Bolton to help the poor people in the Delta. And there I am living in a town in a similar situation. But, uh, we lived in a third world country right here in in the United States of America. And as the court said, the, the, it was so gross until the perversity of the conditions uh, caused it in Hawkins v. Town and Shaw to issue a decision without even finding that the good white folks intended to discriminate against us. I mean, it was just horrendous, the conditions. And the court said that was just un unreasonable and unacceptable. Well, what they were upset about, we I 
On March 27, 1972, the Fifth Circuit affirmed its previous ruling. The court also provided additional statements in response to issues raised in the case. The decision noted the court's reluctance to make a finding about the motives of the town's officials. However, it acknowledged that the record established conduct the court could not judicially approve. The Fifth Circuit found that the facts logically indicate neglect involving clear overtones of racial discrimination that resulted in the same evils which characterize an intentional and purposeful disregard of the principle of equal protection of the laws. The court also reaffirmed its confidence in the feasibility of a remedy where municipal authorities were required to formulate a plan to eliminate disparities by highlighting the biracial committee appointed to advise city officials and the 1970 election of the town's first African-American resident on the city council, Herman Smith. court considered the case of uh, sufficient importance to take it to the entire court. So instead of it being reviewed just by three judges, it was reviewed by 16 judges. At that time, there were 16 judges on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And when we took it, we won it by unanimous decision of the three. And then when it was reviewed by the full court, I think the final vote was something like uh, 13 to 3. We lost three, maybe five judges. Uh, we obviously had a majority, so we succeeded twice on the That became the law. And I went on over there to her house, because it wasn't nothing but a skip and a hop. And they were sitting on the porch, so she said, We were drinking coffee and laughing and talking to her, and then it made her every day. So she said, May Lou, I got something to tell you. Come around here, I got something to tell you. So the mama went around there and heard her be talking. Then the police showed up. And so, uh, he said, Come here, May Lou. So the mama said, I ain't coming to you. So he had his gun. I said, He said, Come here, May Lou. And so mama went to running. Now that's the way I heard the story. So when mama went to running, she knocked on my cousin's door. Well, she was on the back porch. She knocked on her front door and they didn't open. So then she went to me, the neighbor across the street. She didn't open her front door. Then she went to her best friend next door. She didn't open her front door. And then she got to meet Gap. They were standing on the porch. And when she went to run up on her porch, she closed her door. But when she ran around the side, that's when the police shot her through the heart. Smashed up against the wall and shot her through the heart. So the next day they had the inquest. So when we got to the courthouse, they told us, I don't know where y'all going in because y'all can't come to this. So they didn't let us in. So we don't know what they did in the courtroom or what was said in the courtroom. And all the folks supposed to be the witnesses for us, they did it. Mary Lou Hawkins, April 18, 1907 through April 30, 1972, was a community organizer 
and labor rights activist. As a member of the NAACP and Mississippi Freedom Labor Union, she organized volunteer networks and fundraising campaigns to help sustain the work of Shaw Civil Rights Movement. The Hawkins family were among the first families to enroll their children in the all-white segregated Shaw High School. On March 16, 1979, Andrew Hawkins Jr., Bernadette Hawkins, and Mary Yvette Hawkins were murdered by a firebomb that destroyed the Hawkins family home. The Hawkins family's civil rights activism made them frequent targets of racial violence and their home had been set on fire at least two other times. According to Gloria Hawkins, Jr. offered to babysit her four daughters, Andrea, age three, Anastasia, age 6, Mary Yvette, age 8, and Bernadette, age 11. Initially hesitant to leave her young children, she soon relented and went to Greenville with members of the Ever Ready Social Club. While in Greenville, she was alerted that her family home was firebombed. Glory rushed back to Shaw to find her family home completely engulfed in flames. Her club members immediately drove her to Bolivar Medical Hospital in Cleveland, where she learned the fate of Mary Yvette, Bernadette, and Junior. Junior managed to save Andrea and Anastasia from the flames, but they both suffered serious burns over their bodies. As Junior was going back for Bernadette and Mary Yvette, the house caved in. No one was ever held accountable for their deaths. John Brown, Tuttle, these are all Southerners. <laughs> and they're white, they deserve some credit. And, and the fact of the matter is, these movements, the civil rights movement, would never have been successful without black and white together. I really want to make that point over and over and over again. That refrain in the We Shall Overcome, which we sang in every, every opportunity, one of the most important refrains was, black and white together, we shall overcome. And, uh, it's, it's, it's so important to understand that, that one, you need coalitions to win. You've got to have friends. You can't be a small percentage of the population and on the defensive all the time. Unless you line up colleagues, you line up people who join your effort, and you support one another. The other reason this is important, this elimination of, of race as being so important to our, uh, uh, who's right and who's wrong. Uh, another thing is, uh, is history establishes that white and black together made things happen. There were civil rights heroes of all colors, of all races, at all periods of time that joined together to make, to make progress. And, and finally, it's very important to remember that what I'm saying is simply the right thing to do. We're all people. And judging people on the basis of their color is, doesn't work. It's wrong, it's bad politics, and it's bad history. 